Schwarzschild Radius by Connie Willis. When a star collapses, it sort of falls in on itself. Travers curved his hand in a semicircle and brought the fingers in. And sometimes it reaches a kind of point of no return, where gravity pulling in on it is stronger than nuclear and electronic forces, and when it reaches that point, nothing can stop it from collapsing, and it becomes a black hole. He closed his hand into a fist. And that critical diameter, the point where there's no turning back, is called the Schwarzschild radius. Travers paused, waiting for me to say something. He had come to see me every day for a week, sitting stiffly on one of my chairs, an unaccustomed t-shirt and tie, and talked to me about black holes and relativity, even though I taught biology at the university before my retirement, not physics. Someone had told him I knew the Schwarzschild, of course. The Schwarzschild radius, I said in I said in my quaverly old man's voice, as if I could not remember ever hearing the phrase before, and Travers looked disgusted. He wanted me to say, THE Schwarzschild RADIUS! Ah yes, I served with Karl Schwarzschild on the Russian front in World War I. And I tell him all about how he had formulated his theory of black holes while serving with the artillery, but I had not decided yet what to tell him. The event horizon, I said. Yeah, it was named after Schwarzschild because he was the one who worked out the theory, Travers said. He reminded me of Muller with his talk of theories. He was the same age as Muller, with the same shock of stiff yellow hair to the same insatiable curiosity. And perhaps that was why I let him come every day to talk to me, though it was dangerous to let him get so close. I have drawn up a theory of the stars, Muller says, while we warm our hands over it. The prime is so, so that we will get enough feeling in them to be able to hold the liquid barrier without dropping it. They are not balls of fire, as scientists say. They are frozen. How can we see them if they are frozen, I say? Muller is insulted if I do not argue with him. The arguing is part of the theory. Look at the wireless, he says, pointing to it, sitting disemboweled on the table. We have the back off the wireless again. And in the barrier's glass tube, there is a red reflection of the stove's flame. The light is a reflection off the ice of the star. A reflection of what? Of the shells, of course. I do not say that there were stars before there was war, because Muller will not have an answer to this, and I have no desire to destroy his theory. And besides, I do not really believe that there was a time when this war did not exist. The star shells have always exploded over snow-covered craters of no man's land, shattering in a spray of red and white, and perhaps Muller's theory is true. At that point, Travers said, at the event horizon, no more information can be transmitted out of the black hole, because gravity has become so strong, and so the collapse appears frozen at the Schwarzschild radius. Frozen, I said, thinking of Muller. Yeah, as a matter of fact, the Russians call black holes frozen stars. You were at the Russian front, weren't you? What? In World War I. But sure, the star doesn't really freeze, I said. It goes on collapsing. Yes, sure, Travers said. It keeps collapsing in on itself until even the atoms are stripped of their electrons, and there's nothing left except what they call a naked singularity. We can't see past the Schwarzschild radius, and no... Nobody inside a black hole can tell us what it's like in there because they can't get messages out. So no one can ever know what it's like inside a black hole. I know, I said, but he didn't hear me. He leaned forward. What was it like at the front? It is so cold we can only work on the wireless for a few minutes at a time before our hands stiffen and glow clumsy. And we are afraid of dropping the liquid barrier. Mueller holds up his gloves over the Primus stove and puts them on. I jam my hands into the icy stiff pockets. When we are fixing the wireless set, Eisner, who had been delivering messages between the sectors, got up, got sent up to the front where he could not fix his motorcycle. If we cannot fix the wireless, we will cease to be a telegraphist and become soldiers, and we will be sent to the front lines. We are already nearly there. If it, is, if it were not snowing, we could see the barbed wire, wire and pitted snow of no man's land, and the big Russian coal boxes sometimes land in the communications trenches. A shell hits our wireless hut two weeks ago. We are ahead of our own artillery lines, and some of the shells from our own guns fall on us, too. Because mu muzzles are worn out, it is not the front. We guard the liquid barrier with our lives. 
Eisner's unit was set up from the wiring fatigue last night, Mueller said, and they have not come back. I have a theory about what has happened to them. Has the mail come, I say, rubbing my sore eyes and putting my cold hands immediately back into my pockets? I must get some new gloves, yet the quartermaster has none to issue. I have written my mother three times to knit me a pair, but she has not sent them yet. I have a theory about Eisner's unit, he said doggedly. The Russians may have a magnet that has pulled them into the front. <laughs> Magnets pull iron, not people, I say. I have a theory about Muller's theories. Littering the communications trenches are things that the soldiers going up to the front have discarded. Water bottles, haversacks, bayonets. Hans and I sometimes tried to puzzle out why would they discard such important things. Perhaps they were too heavy, I would say, though they did not explain the bayonets and the boots. Perhaps they know they are going to die, Hans would say, picking up a helmet. They would try to cheer him up. My gloves fell out of my pockets yesterday when I went to the quartermasters. I never found them. They are in the trenches somewhere. Yes, he would say, turning the helmet round and round in his hand. Perhaps they are near the front. These things simply drop away from them. My theory is that what happens to the water bottles and the helmets and bayonets is what happened to Mueller. He was a student in university before the war, but his knowledge of science and his intelligence have fallen away from him, and now we are kept so close to the front, all he has left are his theories and his curiosities, which are a dangerous thing to, be, to have kept. Exactly. Magnets pull iron, and they were carrying barbed wire, he says triumphantly, and so they were pulled into the magnet. I put my hands practically into the primus flame and rubbed them together, trying to get rid of the numbness. We had better get the barrier back to the wireless again, or this magnet of yours will suck it out to the front, too. I go back to the wireless. Mueller stays by the stove, thinking about his magnet. The door bangs open. It is not a real door. It's on an iron humpy tied to the beam that reinforces the dugout and held with a wedge. And when somebody pushes against it, it flies inward, bringing the snow in with it. Snow swirls in, and the light... So... <laughs> The sound from the front, the low rumble like a dog growling. I clutch the liquid barrier to my chest. Mueller flings himself over the wireless as if it were a wounded comrade. Someone bundled in a wool coat and mittens, with a wool cap pulled over his ears, stands silhouetted against the reddish light in the doorway, blinking at us. Is Private Rotstra been here? I have come to see about his eyes, he said, and I see it as Dr. Funkeld. Come in and shut the door, I say, still carefully protecting the liquid barrier, but Mueller has already jammed the metal back against the beam. Do you have any news, Mueller says to the doctor, eager for new facts to spin f his theories from? Has the wiring fatigue come back? Is there going to be a bar bombardment tonight? Dr. Funkeld takes off his mitten. I have come to examine your eyes, he says to me. His voice frightens me. All throughout, uh, All through the war, he has kept... His quiet bedside voice, speaking to the wounded in the dressing station at the stretcher's bearer's post, as if they were in the surgery at Stuttgart. But now he sounds agitated. I am afraid it means bombardment is coming, and he will need me at the front. When I went to the dressing station for medicine for my eyes, I foolishly told him I studied medicine with Dr. Zuschauser in Jena. I am afraid he will ask me to assist him, which will mean going to the front. Do your eyes still hurt, he says? I hand the barrier to Mueller and go stand by the lantern that hangs from a nail in the beam. I think he should be invalided, Herr Doctor, Miller says. He knows it is impossible, of course. He was at the wireless the day the message came through that no one was to be invalided out for frostbite or other non-contagious diseases. Can you find me a better light, the doctor says to him. Mueller's curiosity is so strong that he cannot bear to leave any place where something interesting is happening. If he went to the front, I do not think he would be able to pull himself away. And now I expect him to make some excuse uh, to stay. But I have forgotten that he is even more curious about the wiring fatigue. I will go to see what has happened in Eisner's unit, he says, and opens the door. Snow flies in as it, ha it had been beating against the door to get in, and the doctor has to push against the door to get it shut again. My eyes have been hurting, I say, while we are still pushing metal into the place, so that he cannot ask me to assist him. They feel like sand has gotten into them. I have a patient with a disease I do not recognize, he says. I am relieved. Those diseases can kill us as easy as trench mortar. Soldiers die of pneumonia and dysentery and blood poisoning every day in the dressing station, but we do not fear it the way we fear the front. The patient has a fever, excoriated lesions, and suppurating boulier, Dr. Funkeld says.
could it be boils, I say? Uh, the, through the course, he would recognize something as so simple as boils, but he is not listening to me, and I realize that he is, that it is not a diagnosis for me that he has come for. The man is a scientist, a Jew named Schwarzschild, attached to the ar artillery, he says. And because the artillery are even farther back from the front lines than we are, I have volunteered to go look at the patient. He does not want that either. I must talk to this medical headquarters in Baliostock, he says. Our wireless bro is broken, I say, because I do not want to have to tell him why it is impossible for me to send a message for him. We are allowed to send only military messages, and they must be sent in code, tapped out on the telegraph key. It would take hours to send his message, even if it were possible. I hold up the dangling wire. At any rate, you must clear it with the, com the Commandant. But he is already writing out the name and address on a piece of paper, as if this were a telegraph office. Could you send the message when you get the wireless fix? I have written out the symptoms. I put the back on the wireless. Mueller comes back in, kicking the door open. Snow flies everywhere, picking up Dr. Funkeld's message and sending it circling around the dugout. I catch it before it spirals into the flame of the Primus stove. The wiring fatigue was pinned down all night, Mueller says, setting down a heat lamp. He must have gotten it from the dressing station. Five of them froze to death. The other eight have frostbite. The Commandant thinks there may be a bombardment tonight. He does not mention Eisner. He does not say what has happened to the rest of the 30 men in Eisner's unit, though I know. The front has gotten them. I wait, holding the message in my stiff fingers, hoping Dr. Funkeld will say, I must go attend to their frostbite. Let me examine your eyes, the doctor says. He shows Mueller how to get a hold of the hand lamp. Both of them peer into my eyes. I have an ointment for you to use twice daily, he says, getting out a flash jar from his bag. It will burn a little. I will rub it onto my hands, then. It will warm them, I say, thinking of Eisner frozen at the front, still holding the roll of barbed wire, perhaps. He pulls my bottom eyelid down, lid down and rubs the ointment on with his little finger. It does not sting. But I, when I have blinked into my eye, everything has a reddish tinge. Will you have the wireless fixed by tomorrow, he says. I don't know, perhaps. Mueller has not put down the hand lamp. I can see by its light that he has forgotten all about the wiring fatigue and the Russian magnet, and is wondering what the doctor wants with the wireless. The doctor puts on his mittens and picks up his bag. I realize too late that I should have told him I would send them, uh, the message in exchange for them. I will check your eyes tomorrow, he says, and opens the door to the snow. The sound of the front is very close. As soon as he is gone, I tell Muller about Schwarzschild and about the message the doctor wants to send. He will not let me rest until I have told him, and we do not have the time for his curiosity. We must fix the wireless. If you were on the wireless, you would have sent the messages for Schwarzschild, Travers said eagerly. Did you ever send a message to Einstein? They've got a letter Einstein sent to him after he wo wrote his <laughs> wrote him his theory. But if Schwarzschild sent him some kind of message, too, that would be great. It would make my paper. You said that no message can escape a black hole, I said, but they could escape a collapsing star. Is that not so? Okay, Trevor said impatiently, and made his fingers into a semicircle again. Suppose you have a fixed observer over here. He pulled his curved hand back and held his forefinger of his other hand to represent the fixed observer. And you have somebody in the star. Say when the star starts to collapse, the person in it shines the light at the fixed observer. If the star hasn't reached a Schwarzschild radius, the fixed observer will be able to see the light, but it will take it, him longer to reach him because gravity of the black hole is pulling on the light. So it will seem as if time on the star has slowed down and the wavelengths will have been lengthened, so the light will be redder. Of course, that's just a thought problem. There couldn't really be anyone in a collapsing star to send the message. We send messages, I said. I wrote my mother asking, me t asking her to knit me a pair of gloves. There's still something wrong with the wireless. We have received only one message in two weeks. It said, Russian opposition collapsing, and there was so much static we could not make out the rest of it. We have taken the wireless apart twice. The first time, we found a loose wire. The second time, we could not find anything. If Hans were here, he would be able to find the trouble immediately. I have a theory about the wireless, Mueller says. He has ten theories in as many days. The magnet of the Russians is pulling the signals to it. The northern lights, which have been shifting uneasily on the horizon, make 
uh, curtain, and the wireless signals cannot get through. The Russian opposition is not collapsing at all. They are drawing us deeper and deeper into a trap. I say, I'm going to try again. Perhaps the trouble has cleared up. I put the headphones on, so I do not have to listen to his new theory, and I, I hear nothing but a rumbling roar that sounds like the front. I take out the folded piece of paper Dr. Funkeld gave me and lay it on the wireless. He comes every night to see if I had gotten an answer to his message. I take off the headphones and let him listen to the static. I tell him if we cannot get through, we cannot get through, but even if that is true, it is not the real reason I have not sent the message. I'm afraid of the Commandant finding out. I'm afraid of being sent to the front. I have been compromised. I have compromised by writing a letter to the professor that I that I studied medicine with in Jena. I have not gotten... Ah, uh, shit. Well, um... We're just gonna continue now. Cause, yeah. Um... He... Yeah, I'll just cut this later. Um... Uh... You don't have to do that, Mueller says. He sits on the wireless, swinging his legs. He picks up the paper with the symptoms on it and holds it to the flame of the primus stove. I grab for it, but it is already burning redly. I have sent the message for you. I don't believe you. Nothing has been getting out. Didn't you notice the northern lights did not appear last night? I have not noticed. The ointment the doctor gave me makes everything look red at night. I do not believe in Mueller's theories. Nothing is getting out right now, I say. And hold the headphones out to him so he can hear the static. He listens, swinging out his leg. You'll get both of us in trouble. What did you do? I was curious about it. If we are sent up to the front, his curiosity will kill us. He will take apart a landmine just to see how it works. We cannot get in trouble for sending military messages. I said the Commandant was afraid of poisonous gas the Russians were using. He swings his leg and grins, because now I am the curious one. Well, did you get an answer? Yes, he says maddeningly, and puts the headphones on. It is not a poisonous gas. I shrug as if I do not care whether I get an answer or not. I put on my cap and muffler my mother knitted for me and open the door. I'm going out to see if the mail has come. Perhaps there will be a letter in there for my, from my professor. Nature of disease unknown, Mueller shouts against the sudden force of snow. Possibly impedigo or glandular disorder. I grin back at him and say, If there's a package from my mother, I will give you half of what is in it. Even if it is your gloves? No, not if it is my gloves. I say, and I go find the doctor. At the dressing station, they tell me he has gone to see Schwarzschild, and will give me directions to the artillery staff's headquarters. It is not very far, but it is snowing, and my hands are already cold. I go to the quartermasters and ask if the mail has come in. There is a new recruit there, trying to fix Eisner's motorcycle. All the parts are spread out on the ground around him in a circle. He points to the burlap sack and says, that is all the mail there. There, Look through it yourself. Snow has gotten into the sack and melted. The ink from the envelopes has run, and I squint at them, trying to make out the names. My eyes begin to hurt. There is not a package from my mother or a letter from my professor, but there is a letter from Lieutenant Schwarzschild, with the return address says, Doctor. Perhaps he has written the doctor himself. I am delivering a message to the artillery headquarters, I say, showing the letter to the recruit. I will take this up, too. Recruit nods and goes on working. It has gotten dark while I was inside, and it is snowing harder. I jam my hands inside the ice-stiff pockets of my coat and start to the artillery headquarters in the rear. It is pitch dark in the communication trenches, and the wind twists and the snow funnels it howling along them. I take off my muffler and wrap it around my hands like a girl's muff. Now I am the one who sits endlessly in front of the wireless, sending out messages to the Red Cross, to my professor, Jet in... Gina, Gen <laughs> to Dr. Einstein. I have frostbitten uh, the forefinger and thumb of my right hand and have to tap out the letters with my left. Nothing is getting out, but I must get a message out. I must find someone to tell me the name of the Schwarzschild's disease. I have a theory, Mueller says. The Jews have seized power, seized power and signed a treaty with the Russians. We are now completely cut off. I am going to see if the mail has come, I say so I do not have to listen to any more of his theories. But the doctor stops me on the way out of the hut. I tell him what the message said. Impetigo, the doctor shouts. You saw him. Did that look like Impetigo to you? I shake my head, unable to tell him what I think it looks like. 
What are his symptoms? Mueller asked, burning with curiosity. I have not told him about Schwarzschild. I am afraid that if I tell him, he will only become more curious and insist on going up to the front to see Schwarzschild himself. Let me see your eyes, the doctor says in his beautiful, calm voice. I wish you would ask Mueller to go for a hand lamp again so that I could s ask him how Schwarzschild is. But he has brought a candle with him. He holds it close to my face so that I cannot see anything but the red flame. Is Lieutenant Schwarzschild worse? What are his symptoms? Mueller says, leaning forward. His symptoms are craters and shell holes, I think. I am sorry to have not told Mueller, for it has, would only have made him more curious. Until now I have told him everything, even how Hans died when the wireless hut was hit, how he laid in liquid the barrier carefully down on top of the wireless before he tried to cough up what was left of his chest and catch it in his hands. But I cannot tell him this. What symptoms does he have, Mueller says again, his nose almost in the candle's flame, but the doctor turns from him as if he cannot hear him and blows the candle out. The doctor unwraps the dressing and looks at my fingers. They are swollen and red. Mueller leans over the doctor's shoulder. I have a theory about Lieutenant Schwarzschild's disease, he says. Shut up, I say. I don't want to hear any more of your stupid theories. I do not care about the wounded look on Mueller's face or the way he goes and sits by the wireless. For now, I have a theory, and it is more horrible than anything Mueller could have dreamed of. We are all of us, Mueller and the recruit who is trying to put together Eisner's motorcycle, and perhaps even the doctor with his steady bedside of voice, afraid of the front. But our fear is not complete, because... Unspoken in it is our belief that the front is something separate from us, something we can keep away from us by keeping our wireless or the motorcycle fixed, something we can survive by flattening our faces to the frozen earth, something we can escape altogether without being invalided out, by being invalided out. But the front is not separate. It is in Schwarzschild, and the symptoms I have been sending out, superative boule and excoriated lesions, are not what is wrong with him at all. The lesions on his skin are only the barbed wire and shell holes connecting the trenches of a front that is somewhere farther in. The doctor puts a new dressing of crepe paper on my hand. I have tried to invalid Schwarzschild out, the doctor says. Mueller looks at him astounded. Supply lines are blocked with snow. Schwarzschild cannot be invalided out, I say. The front is inside him. The doctor puts a roll of crepe paper back in his kit and closes it. When the roads open again, I will invalid you out for frostbite, and Mueller too. Mueller is so surprised he blurts, out, he blurts out, I do not have frostbite, but the doctor is no longer listening. You must both escape, he says, and I am not even sure he is listening to himself while you can. I have a theory about why you have not told me what is wrong with Schwarzschild, Mueller says as soon as the doctor is gone. I'm going for the mail. There will not be any mail, Mueller shouts after me. The supply lines are blocked, but the mail is there, scattered among the motorcycle parts. There are only a few parts left, and as soon as the roads are cleared, the recruit will be able to climb along the motorcycle and ride away. I gather up the letters and take them to the lantern and try to read them, but my eyes are so bad I cannot see anything but a red blur. I am taking them to, back to the wireless hut, I say, and the recruit nods without ever looking up. It is starting to snow, and Mueller meets me at the door. I brush past him and turn the f flame of the Primus stove up as high as it will go and hold the letters up behind it. I will read them for you, Mueller says eagerly, looking through the envelopes I have discarded. Look, here is a letter from your mother. Perhaps she sent you your gloves. I squint at the letters one by one while he tears open my mother's letter to me. Even though I hold them so close to the flame that the paper scorches, I cannot make out the names. Dear son, Mueller reads, I have not heard from you in three months. Are you hurt? Are you ill? Do you need anything? The last letter is from Professor Zuschauer in Jena. Jena, whatever. I can see his name quite clearly on the corner of the envelope, though mine is blurred beyond recognition. I tear it open. There is nothing written on the red paper. I thrust it at Mueller. Read this, I say. I have not finished with your mother's letter yet, she, uh, Mueller says, but he takes the letter and reads, Dear Er Rochebin, I have received your letter yesterday, but I could hardly decipher your writing. Do you not have any decent pens at the front? The disease you describe is called Newman's disease, or Femigate. I snatch the letter out of Newman's hands and run to the door. Let me come with you, Mueller shouts. You must stay and watch the wireless, I say joy joyously, running along the communication trends. Schwarzschild does not have the front inside of him. He has femagus. He has Newman's disease, and now he can be invalided home to the hospital. 
I go down and think I have tripped over a discarded helmet or a tin of beef, but there's a crash, and dirt and riveting fall all around me. I hear the low buzz of a daisy cutter and flatten myself into the trench, but the buzz does not become a whine. It stops, and there's another crash as the trench caves in. I scramble out of the trench before it can suffocate me and crawl along the edge toward Schwarzschild's dugout, but the trench is caved in along its length, and when I crawl up over the loose dirt, I lose it in the swirling snow. I cannot tell which way the front lies, but I know it, it is very close. The sound comes at me from all directions, a deafening roar in which no individual sounds can be distinguished. The snow is so thick I cannot see the burst of flame from the muzzles of gunfire, and no part of the horizon looks redder than any other. It is all red, even the snow. I crawl in what I think is the direction of the trench, but as soon as I do, I am in barbed wire. I stop, breathing hard, my face and hands pressed into the snow. I have come the wrong way. I am at the front. I hear a sound out of the barrage of sound, a sound of tires in the snow. I think it is a tank. I cannot breathe at all. The sound comes closer, and in spite of myself, I look up, and it is the recruit who is at the quartermaster's. He is a long way away, behind a coiled line of barbed wire, but I can see him quite clearly in spite of the snow. He has the motorcycle fixed, and as I watch, he flings a leg over and presses his foot down. Go, I shout. Get out. The motorcycle jumps forward. Go. The motorcycle comes towards me, picking up speed. It rears up, and I think it is going to jump the barbed wire, but it falls instead. The motorcycle first, and then the recruit, spiraling t down towards the iron spikes. The ground heaves, and I fall too. I have fallen into Schwarzschild's dugout. Half of it is caved in, and the timber balks <laughs> sticking out at angles from the heap of dirt and snow, but the blanket is still all o is still over the door. Schwarzschild is propped up in the chair. The doctor is bending over him. Schwarzschild has his shirt off. His chest looks like Hans did. The front roars, and more of the roof crumbles. It's all right. It's a disease, I shout. I have brought you a letter to prove it. I hand him the letter, which I have been clenching in my unfeeling hand. The doctor grabs a letter from me. Snow whirls around on the ruined roof, but Schwarzschild does not put his on his shirt. He watches uninterestingly as the doctor reads the letter. The symptoms you describe are almost most certainly those of Newman's disease or Firmis vulgaris. vulgaris. I have treated two patients with disease, both Jews. <laughs> It is a disease of the mucous membranes that is not contagious. Its cause is unknown. It always ends in death. Dr. Funkeld cross crumples up the paper. You came all this way in the middle of a bombardment to tell me there is no hope? He shouts in a, vo a voice I do not even recognize. It is so unlike his steady doctor voice. You should have tried to get away. You should have... And then he is gone under a crashing of dirt and splintered timbers. I struggle, struggle towards short shroud through the maelstrom of red dust and snow. Put your shirt on, I shout at him. We must get out of here. I crawl to the door to see if we can get through to the communications trench. Mueller bursts through the blanket. He's carrying, impossibly, the wireless. Headphones trail behind him in the snow. I came here to see what has happened to you. I thought you were dead. The communications trenches are shot to pieces. It is as I feared. His curiosity got the best of him, and now he is trapped too. Though it seems not to know, he seems not to know it. He hoists the wireless onto the table without looking at it. His eyes are on Schwarzschild, who leans into the remaining wall of the dugout, his shirt in his hands. Your shirt, I shout, and come to help Schwarzschild put it on over the craters and shell holes of his blasted skin. The air screams, and the mouth of the dugout blows in. I grab the Schwarzschild, I grab at Schwarzschild's arms, and the skin of it comes off in my hands. He falls against the table, and the wireless goes over. I can hear the splintering tinkle of the liquid barrier breaking, and then the whole dugout is caving in, and we are under the table. I cannot see anything. Mueller, I shout, where are you? I'm hit, he says. I try to find him in the darkness, but I am crushed against Schwarzschild. I cannot move. Where are you, hit? In the arm, he says. I hear him try to move it. The movement dislodges more dirt, and it falls around us, shutting out all sound from the front. All I can hear is the creak of wood as the table legs give way. Schwarzschild, I say? He doesn't answer. But I know he is not dead. His body is as hot as the Primus stove flame. My hand is underneath his body while I try to shift it, but I cannot. The dirt falls like snow, piling up around us. That darkness is red for a while, and then I cannot even see that. I have a theory, Miller says in a voice so close and devoid of curiosity, it might as well be mine, that this is the end of the world. Was that when Schwarzschild was sent home on sickly, Travers said? Or validated, or whatever you Germans call it. 
Well, yeah, it had to be, because he died in March. <laughs> what happened to Mueller? I had hoped he would go away as soon as I had told him what happened to Schwarzschild, but he had made no move to get up. Mueller was invalided out with a broken arm. He became a scientist. The way you did, he opened his notebook again. Did you see Schwarzschild after that? The question makes no sense. After you got out, before he died? It seems to take a long time for his words to get to me. The message bends and curves, shifting into the red, and I can hardly make it out. No. I say, though it is a lie. Trevor scribbles. I really do appreciate it, Dr. Roshbin. I have always been curious about Schwartz's child, and now that you've told me all this stuff, I'm even more interested, Trevor says, or seems to say. Messages coming in are warped like a gravitational blizzard into something that no longer resembles speech. If you'd be willing to help me, I'd like to write my thesis on him. Go. Get out. It was a lie, I say. I never knew Schwarzschild. I saw him once from, the, from a distance. Your fixed observer. Trevor looks up expectantly from his notes, as if he is still waiting for me to answer him. Schwarzschild was never even in Russia, I lie. He spent the whole winter in a hospital in Groton. I lied to you. There was nothing but uh, a thought problem. He waits, pencil ready. You can't stay here, I shout. You have to get out. There is no safe distance from which a fixed observer can watch without being drawn in. And once you are inside the Schwarzschild radius, you can't get out. Don't you understand? We are still there. We are still there, trapped in the trenches of the Russian front, while a dying star burns itself out, spiraling down into the center where time ceases to exist, where everything ceases to exist, except the naked singularity that is somehow Schwarzschild. Mueller tries to dig out the wireless with his crushed arm so he can send a message that nobody can hear. Help us! Help us! I struggle to free the hands in spite of Schwarzschild's war warmth are now cold. I cannot feel them. And in the very center, Schwarzschild burns himself out, the black hole at the center imploding him, cell by cell, carrying him down into the darkness, and us with him. It is a trap, I shout at Travers from the center. The message struggles to escape, and then falls back. I wonder how he figured it out, Travers said. I can now hear him clearly. I mean, can you imagine trying to figure out something like a theory of black holes in the middle of a war while you are suffering from a fatal disease? Just to think, when he came up the... With the theory, he didn't have any idea that black holes even existed.